this is uh, the late 1600s. It's been decades since the original Rosicrucian Fuhrer, and in between that time was the Thirty Years' War. Uh, Europe was ravaged. Uh, now, I don't think you can blame this specifically on the Rosicrucian manifestos, but they certainly didn't help anything because you had this, you people had these utopian ideals and they were shattered by this carnage of the Thirty Years' War. People, obviously a lot of death, people were displaced and exiled. Um, a good example of someone that was really disavowed of, disabused of his illusions about you Rosicrucianism and Utopianism was uh, Jan Comenius. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He was a German, actually I think he was Czech, and he lost, I think, uh, his home, and he had to go into exile as a result of the Thirty Years' War, and he blamed it partially on the utopianism that stemmed from these Rosicrucian manifestos and this, the furor that sprang up around them. And uh, he was not too pleased at all about it. And he went on to be a major figure in uh, education, uh, teaching philosophy of education uh, later on. Uh, he's highly revered in Czech society as uh, the teacher, even today. Now, Kelpius hooked up with a gentleman named Johann Zimmermann, and they decided that, along with their friends who were members of these theosophical circles in Germany, that um, they were tired of being persecuted, that they you know, would lose their position at university if they were openly esoteric and profess these ideals that were somewhat at odds with Lutheran doctrine, as strict as it may be. And they decided we're going to go elsewhere. We're going to travel to foreign lands, if you will, establish a community where we can be open about what we believe, we can practice our beliefs, and no one's going to bother us. Well, it just so happened around that time you had the 13 colonies in America, specifically Pennsylvania, which was, more than any other colony, uh, very liberal, especially in terms of religion. William Penn uh, is you know, famous for this. So they decided they were going to go, and they were going to do it. So they got together. Um, first, they left for England, because that was where they were going to charter a boat. So they traveled to England. I believe this is 1692. So they travel to England. While in England, they stay with a group of theosophists there who were led by a woman named Jane Lead, who was a uh, follower of a gentleman named Dr. John Portage, who was a noted theosophist in England. Um, so they stayed there, I believe, about six months. On the eve of when they were supposed to depart for America, Zimmerman dies. Now, I believe Kelpius at that time is in his early 20s. And he, by default, he's now the leader of this group. I think it's a group of about 30 to 40 people, men and women. And this young man, this child prodigy, is now their leader. They're looking to him for inspiration, for guidance, to help get them across the sea to their new land in the wilderness. And, you know, this... Pennsylvania was certainly not settled at all at this point in time. There were still Native Americans living there. Um, there were no guarantees about what they would find except religious freedom, and that was all that they cared about. So they get on the ship, and they start their journey, and immediately they encounter hardships. Um, before they even make it to the ocean, the ship is rocked by storms. Uh, they they drop anchor. 
The winds are so strong, the anchor chain breaks, they're adrift. They fire off their cannons to try to signal other ships around them for help. They, the help does not come. <laughs> they start to pray. And they pray and pray. And eventually, they get themselves righted. Uh, they survive the storm. And they attributed it to divine intervention. So eventually, they, they start their journey in the ocean, and uh, I think notably, uh, they make landfall in Pennsylvania on June 24th of 1694. Now, for anybody who knows, uh, June 24th is typically known as the feast day of the birth of St. John the Baptist. Now, St. John the Baptist is highly revered in many esoteric traditions in the West and uh, even in Islamic lands as uh, a patron saint or perhaps even greater than that. Uh, even in Freemasonry, he's one of the patron saints. And I think it's notable that that's the date that they made landfall, and I'm I have no evidence to back this up, but I'm guessing they probably were there and waited until that day to disembark. It was a significant day to them, obviously. And I'll get to it in a moment, but there's, there's other uh, instances where this day comes up again in their history. So... Unfortunately, uh, the only real historical analysis we had prior to the 20th century was a gentleman named Dr. Julius Friedrich Soxe. Dr. Soxe was a historian of the German community in eastern Pennsylvania and president of the historical, the German Historical Society there. He had access to people, uh, documents, and relics from Kelpius's community as well as the successors to Kelpius' community, and that's Johann Beisel. We'll get to him shortly. Um, so Dr. Soxe is really the source of the connection between these communities and Rosicrucianism. And he's not really, he doesn't mince words. He says basically, these were Rosicrucians. They were establishing what they thought of as a theosophical Rosicrucian community. That was their vision, and that's what they set out to do, and that's what they did. He's totally unabashed about that. One of the reasons that he's so strongly convinced of it is a text that was passed down from the Kelpius community to Ephrata Cloister to his personal possession. And this is known as the Doma Manuscript. And Doma stands for Deo Optimo Maximo Altissimo. My Latin's not good, but I think that means something about God the Most High, Great, Wonderful. This is a copy of this Doma manuscript published by the Philosophical Research Society and Manley P. Hall. Originally, I think it was in 1927 or 28, this version is from 1971. Now, you can see right from the cover, uh, we're, we've got esoteric symbolism, alchemical symbolism, Kabbalistic ideas. The, the, the book is, is filled with it. Um, I don't know. We can... Let me, for our own edification, we can, maybe we can pass this example around. People can take a look at that. Um, this is a, is a page from the document that was translated into English because it was originally in German. Now, 
Now, when I look at this, what I see is precisely what I said. It's filled with alchemical symbolism, Gnostic theosophy, hermetic ideas, uh, and Rosicrucianism, essentially. I mean, you have the idea of the pelican, uh, the cross, the heart, um, all the alchemical symbolisms here. It's pretty overwhelming. Now, Soxe, Dr. Soxe says, you know, these guys are Rosicrucians. There's really no question about it. Manley Hall, who published this book, says the opposite, which I think is fascinating. Because he has, he talked to some of the people that Dr. Soxe used for his research. He obtained the text. He had it in front of him, and he says, they're not Rosicrucians. He identifies them as exoteric Christians. Exoteric, not, not esoteric. That they belong more in the realm of fundamentalist Christians and not so much in the the I, in the school of the of the spirit of the rose cross. Now, why would he say this? And that that's my question. Why indeed? Why would he say this? Now we know Manley Hall was a member of Max Heindel's Rosicrucian-inspired group in California. In fact, he was raised from age 16 by Heindel's widow Augusta. Early in his career, uh, he actually wore a rose cross laman, you know, when he did religious services and lectures. So clearly he identified himself, at least at one point in time, with the idea of the rose cross. I think, and again, this is purely speculation on my part, I think this is evidence of this close sense of connection and ownership to a tradition and not wanting to see others as part of that tradition for whatever reason it, it may be. Maybe because he was taught that they weren't. It could be as simple as that. I really don't know. But I will tell you this came out in the late 20s, early 30s, 1985. Manley Hall is an old man. He publishes a book about a gentleman named Magister Christoph Schlegel. Now, Magister Christoph Schlegel accompanied Johannes Kelpius on his journey to colonial Pennsylvania and settled with him uh, in his community, the semi-monastic community. And it wasn't until Schlegel's descendants provided Manley Hall with direct evidence that Schlegel's family was directly connected to Johann Valentin Andre in Germany, and that they were part of the original Rosicrucian Fuhrer that occurred in the early 1600s. In the appendix to this book that Manley Hall published, which was essentially a history of Schlegel and didn't really address Rosicrucianism or Schlegel's uh, history with Johannes Kelpius in the New World, but in the appendix, he basically says Schlegel is intimately connected with the Rosicrucian movement by default it looks like he was part of this community and therefore you know maybe they were rosicrucian i think this is fascinating because uh in this book he stridently says they're not connected to rosicrucianism despite what i think are pretty good indicators that they may have been and then 
about 55, 60 years later, he comes back and says, well, maybe they were, in an appendix to a very little-known book that not many people would have any desire to pick up. To me, that says, you know, maybe he was wrong originally, and maybe he was trying to not necessarily make amends, but correct the record certainly not in a way that I think is necessary because this DOMA manuscript, yeah, <laughs> it's interesting, um, you know, and he actually calls it Codex Rosi Crucis, right? And he says, basically, this group in Pennsylvania, they possess the document, but that doesn't make them Rosicrucian, okay? Now, he's a somewhat respected uh, authority on the subject, but he's not an academic, and I think today you'll find a lot of people who will very readily dispute Manley Hall and his claims about all sorts of things. Um, be that as it may, he did actually travel to Pennsylvania and interview these people and talk to them that he came to a conclusion that I think is at odds with mine, I think is evidence of a personal bias. But again, this is purely speculation on my part. Okay, so to get back to the story, um, in addition to this text, um, they had copies of Johannes Kelpius' diary, or Dr. Soxe did, the historian. And what is notable about his diary is that in the margins, for every entry in the diary, Kelpius has recorded the astrological timings, you know, where is the sun, where is the moon, um, what planet are they connected with, what constellation, um, he's, he's marking it. And not just for use in esoteric practice, but also because he was thinking about the second coming, the end times, the apocalypse, that the Christ was going to return and that the world was going to end. So I just want to read uh, some of the things that Soxe wrote because, the, again, they were really he didn't mince words. He said, Kelpius and his followers came to the Western world to put into execution that long-cherished plan of founding a true theosophical Rosicrucian community. With the decline of the first organization, which was Kelpius's woman in the wilderness colony, which is what they were referred to as, the scene shifted from the Wissahickon River to the Cocalico at Ephrata Cloister, where the mystic theosophy Phoenix likes rose again from its ashes in that retired valley beside the flowing brook. The secret rites and mysteries of the true Rosicrucian philosophy flourished for years. I think that's pretty clear in his opinion what they were. Um, he also recounts notably in a book called German Sectarians of Pennsylvania that Johann Conrad Beisel, who was Kelpius' successor, was actually initiated into a secret Rosicrucian fraternity in Heidelberg, Germany. And that, he says, the speculations and mystic teachings of Beisel and Beisel's successor, Peter Miller, were nothing less than the Rosicrucian doctrine, pure and undefiled. So, on one hand, we have Dr. Soxa. On the other hand, we have Manley Hall. Joining Manley Hall, we have another esoteric scholar, Arthur Edward Waite. In 19, uh, was it 32? No, 24, I'm sorry. He published a book called The Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross. In that book, he has a chapter on the American Rosicrucian movement, all about the Pennsylvania theosophists. And his conclusion is pretty similar to Manley Hall's, that they were esotericists, but they were not Rosicrucian. 
that they were not. And there's a number of noted academics that have the same point of view. Uh, you have Walter Klein, who wrote Johann Conrad Beisel, Mystic, and Martinet. He clearly has a very low opinion of these guys. Um, Elizabeth Fisher, Prophecies and Revelations, German Kabbalists in early Pennsylvania. Um, now, Ed Jeffrey Bach, Voices of the Turtle Doves. He basically says, you know, there's just no way they were Rosicrucian. Um, and then you have some other people on the other side. Uh, notably, I think, is this gentleman, Peter Erb, who wrote an introduction to the mystical and historical texts of Ephrata Cloister and says you know, they definitely were Rosicrucian. Now, Peter Erb, I don't think it is... He's not impartial, just like Julius Soxley was probably not impartial. He was a member of the German community, the descendants of, of these very people. Um, so for some reason, their descendants want to believe they are Rosicrucian. And then you have on the other side people like Manley Hall and Arthur Edward Waite, who I would call self-styled neo-Rosicrucians, who say there's no way they were not Rosicrucians. Uh-uh. Not at all. Now then you have uh, Arthur Versalis again in Wisdom's Children. He's impartial about the question. He says, yes, some people call them Rosicrucian, others don't. It doesn't really matter. I can respect that point of view because at least he gives evidence that we can look at to try to make up our own mind about whether their beliefs and practices seem to match up or not. There's also a gentleman named Jan Stries who wrote an article, uh, The Alchemy of the Voice at Ephrata Cloister, and he says that basically along the same lines as I'm trying to say that their beliefs and practices share a remarkable number of similarities with Rosicrucianism. Their use of sacred music, the alchemical symbolism, the Gnostic theosophy, the stress on inward spirituality and meditation are all indicators that we could call them Rosicrucian. And I think this debate really, it really is a good reminder of how difficult it is and, and why this idea is so controversial to some. Uh, calling anybody a Rosicrucian is pretty much impossible before the 19th century when you had Pascal Beverly Randolph come out and say, I was initiated in Egypt. Um, I am the founder of the Rosicrucian fraternity in America. I've been chartered and authorized to do so by the Mystic Brotherhood. And um, he may be right. There's evidence to connect him with the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor. And um, it's certainly viewed today as someone who is a forerunner of modern Rosicrucianism. In fact, uh, there's a group that exists now in Pennsylvania uh, Forgive me if I can't recall the gentleman's name who's his successor, but they claim the legacy of Pascal Beverly Randolph, and they have a modern Rosicrucian fraternity in Pennsylvania. Um, I think it, I'm sorry, the name escapes me. If you look it up online, you can find it. Um, they're not connected to Amorc, though. So... That's that's basically Kelpius. They these guys uh, they lived in as hermits basically in the wilderness. Um, they didn't profess even that they were Christian. At their religious services, they were often quoting revelations, and outsiders who would come picked up on this and started calling them the woman in the wilderness because they were basically waiting for that woman in the wilderness who they interpreted as the divine Sophia.
Now, Kelpius had some things to say about his group and, and his philosophies. One of them was uh, that he regarded the strands within the web of reformers as many manifestations of the same movement. He viewed Gnostic theosophy, a la Jakob Berme, uh, Christian Kabbalism, Rosicrucian-inspired philosophies and practices, and Rosicrucian fraternities as all part of one big mess um, that came out of the same source. He said they're virtually indistinguishable. They use the same symbolism. They have very similar philosophies and ideas. The practices are all the same. Uh, you know, it's it's like a the idea of a branched candlestick. It's different lights, but they're all supported by the same source. So. Kelpius and his followers lived in the wilderness. He actually lived in a, in a cave in the side of a hill. Um, they erected an astronomical observatory on top of which they placed a symbol that uh, you can see on the Gnostic NYC logo, sometimes called a circle cross, uh, often referred to as a rose cross. Uh, they practiced alchemy, and I don't mean just spiritual alchemy. In fact, uh, interestingly, when Kelpius died, there was a coffin that contained his alchemical books and his uh, glassware, I'm assuming, and whatever substances he was working with. And on his deathbed, he instructed... Uh, his successor to dispose of the casket by throwing it in the river. So this gentleman decided, well, he's dying. I'm just going to stash it on the riverbank, and when he's gone, I'll check it out and see what he's got in there. <laughs> so he goes and stashes it, and he comes back to Kelpius, and Kelpius says, you, you didn't follow my directions. What are you doing? So he says, I'm sorry, you know, and then he goes back, throws it in the river, and supposedly it explodes, catches fire, and it's, his testimony is there was thunder and lightning from the water as it sank. And so he goes back to Kelpius, and Kelpius says, thank you. And he dies. Now, Kelpius thought uh, originally that he wasn't, going to simply die, he thought he would be carried up to heaven uh, in the same way that the that Enoch was um, transformed into Metatron and uh, esoteric doctrine. Um, as he lay on his deathbed, I think for three days, uh, he lamented that it has been ordained that I'm going to perish as a, as a regular man and I'm not going to be taken up to heaven in that way. And he died at the age of, I believe, 35. Now, his community, um, they had already had some members who married, even though it was a sort of a monastic group. And it, it pretty much fell apart after he died. And I think that's pretty common with most esoteric groups when the the leader, the inspired leader dies, they usually uh, go their separate ways. Um, but they were all in that general area. Um, and before we get to the next part of the story, I just want to mention that um, I said that they landed on June 24th in 1694. Seven years later to the day, there was an incident in their community where an apparition appeared to them, not just one of them, to the entire group. They said they saw a light.